American history has many dark chapters, some of the darkest occurring during colonial times, when European settlers often clashed with Native Americans, ending in deadly result. I'm Cody Knapper, and today we examine the life and murder of the Shawnee leader known as Chief Cornstalk. Little is known about Cornstalk's early life, but historians agree that he was most likely born in Pennsylvania in 1720. Sometime in 1755, during the beginning of the French and Indian War, Cornstalk assumed leadership of a group of the Shawnee in the Ohio Valley. Chief Cornstalk would garner a reputation as a strong motivator whose integrity and pragmatic leadership was well respected by his contemporaries individual towns, sometimes a cluster of towns would have a, you know, a single chief, but you don't have a, you know, chief of the Shawnee or the chief of the Cherokee. That's just not really how that worked, certainly not in the 18th century. The Shawnee were an exiled group of Native Americans, and they happened to be under the control of a, of a large Native American confederacy called the Iroquois. The Iroquois were a confederacy of five different large Native American groups who banded together essentially in the 18th century to uh, provide themselves some protection against European incursion. The key thing to understand about the Shawnee in the 18th century is that these Ohio Indians broadly, and the Shawnee specifically, were not really in control of their own political decision making. Indigenous people um, often refer to political, military uh, relationships in familial terms. So they'll, they'll talk about their, their fellow townspeople as their brothers and sisters. And the Iroquois, back in there, basically around Albany, New York, um, the Iroquois Confederacy talked about the Ohio Indians as their children. And the Ohio Indians sort of referred to them, at least initially, as their fathers. So it gives you, that, that familial language gives you a sense of the relationship between the Shawnee that are, you know, out here on the Ohio River and the Iroquois back in New York. The Iroquois kind of controlled the Shawnee. They decided about, you know, uh, military policy, land policy, whatever, a everything. They, the, the Iroquois sort of made those decisions, and the Shawnee were given a small degree of autonomy, but that's how that worked. In 1768, in what is now Rome, New York, the Treaty of Fort Stanwix was signed between the Iroquois Confederation and Great Britain. The treaty established a line of property along the Ohio River that yielded most of modern-day West Virginia to the British. Cornstalk and the Shawnee, along with some other Native American nations, were not represented at the treaty and still used that area as a hunting ground. This led to several conflicts despite Cornstalk's efforts to prevent hostilities. Eventually, the chief and his Shawnee would be forced to fight as well. So after the French and Indian War, which bankrupts the British government, and then Pontiac's Rebellion that comes right on the heels of that, that leads to the destruction of almost every major British fort and town in, on the western frontier and in the Ohio Valley, and New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia send delegates up to Fort Stanwyck, and they negotiate a new treaty that essentially pushes the line between white settlement and Native American reservations west. And for our story, it pushes it to the Ohio River. The Ohio River now becomes the Fort Stanwyck line. Um, now, the real problem with all of this goes back to what I was talking about before, which is the fact that the Ohio Indians are not part of the negotiations at the Treaty of Fort Stanwyck. And the Iroquois back in New York make these decisions. But the Ohio Indians don't acknowledge these treaties because the land that's been given away is their land. The threats to their families from whites who are moving now to the banks of the eastern banks of the Ohio River, these threats are on their families, not the Iroquois. 
After the French and Indian War and the loss of their French allies, and certainly after the abandonment of the Proclamation Line of 1763 and the signing of the Treaty of Fort Stanwyck, you see a flood of whites pouring into what becomes West Virginia. And they are moving closer and closer to Ohio Indian communities, in this case, Lower Shawnee communities. And it looks like a flood of, of white faces threatening their homes, their communities, their towns, their lifestyles, their, their, their own fields. Um, so the Ohio Indians began a concerted effort to push back. Now, this isn't new. Um, the Ohio Indians had been pushing back since the 1730s. You know, it's not about taking anything. It's about driving whites back east to protect that land. Native American warriors and militiamen are not the only people involved. The killing of families, women and children, the burning of homes, of villages, towns, both sides. Scalping, which is often held up as a, a Native American thing, plenty of white scalping going on. We're talking about as violent as you can imagine. And that's, that's sort of swirling out, out west. So you've got western uh, uh, British colonists out on the frontier saying, where are you? Uh, where's, our, where's our colony? Where are you, Dunmore? We need protection. Lord Dunmore decides to answer the demands of his fellow Virginians to do something about these Native Americans and, their, and the violent attacks that are going on white settlements. You've got all these political developments beginning to happen. You can hear the whispers of what becomes the American Revolution occurring. I mean, it's a really chaotic period of time. And into that, Lord Dunmore decides to launch his efforts to essentially dislodge the Ohio Indians and force them to accept the terms of the Treaty of Fort Stanwyck, the terms essentially to give up West Virginia, uh, what becomes West Virginia, and Western Pennsylvania, and quit trying to block land speculation in white Western settlements. On October 10, 1774, Andrew Lewis, with a force of 1,000 Virginia militiamen, camped on the banks of the Ohio, and fearing that an invasion of the Shawnee territory was looming, Cornstalk went on the offensive. What occurred was the Battle of Point Pleasant, a violent and bloody melee that lasted most of the day before the Shawnee were pushed back across the river. In total, more than 100 men were killed and hundreds of others were wounded during the battle. Dunmore would rendezvous with Lewis at Point Pleasant and then they would cross the Ohio River and they would attack the Ohio Indian settlements uh, up and down the Ohio River. Cornstalk was, had kind of become the face of the Ohio Indian resistance movement, but their goal wasn't just to attack the lower Shawnee towns. They were, gonna, they were gonna wipe out as many of the Ohio Indians as possible, or at least force them into submission. That was the goal. Lewis would have a thousand, roughly a thousand troops. Dunmore would have a thousand troops. Two thousand troops strong, they'd cross the Ohio River and attack. Cornstalk has scouts who follow both armies. They know where everyone is, and they realize when Lewis gets to Point Pleasant that Dunmore's a day or two away with his army, and Cornstalk decides, we'll go over there, we'll sneak up on Lewis's forces before it's doubled in size, we'll crush Lewis's force, we'll retreat, and when Dunmore gets here, then we'll attack that group. So we essentially kind of a divide and conquer approach because of Lund Dunmore sort of broke the, you know, violated the plan, deviated from the plan. On that morning, under the cover of fog, Cornstalk's warriors attack Andrew Lewis. So when Cornstalk surround them, surrounds them, the shooting starts. It takes Lewis's forces a little while to kind of catch their bearings. But according to the historical sources, they're able to sort of regroup and through the use of superior firepower and uh, the skill of the soldiers, they're able to essentially win the battle. Cornstalk retreats his, his forces back to his lower Shawnee town. Um, the next day, as Lewis is sort of, I guess, counting his casualties and, and, and that sort of thing, Dunmore shows up in Point Pleasant, and they decide at this point they will take the full army across the Ohio River um, to right outside of what now is now Chillicothe and set up a camp. Dunmore sends for Cornstalk. Cornstalk shows up, and Dunmore basically says, look, here are the terms. He's basically told, accept it, or we will essentially kill all of you. Um, and 
Uh, he signs the so-called Treaty of Camp Charlotte. Three years later, the fighting between the British and the American colonists had turned into a full-blown revolutionary war. So Cornstalk, along with a small group of Shawnee, including his son, decided to return to Point Pleasant, this time to talk peace. The great chief hoped to maintain the Shawnee as a neutral party, but instead was taken captive by the American commander at Fort Randolph. While being held hostage, an American soldier outside the fort was killed by unknown natives. Inside the fort, his fellow Americans demanded retribution. A group stormed the area where Cornstalk and the other Shawnee were being held and opened fire. According to accounts, the chief wasn't afraid of his coming fate, but instead stood calmly and faced his killers. After the assassination of Cornstalk, the Ohio Indians used that assassination as motive, as fuel, to launch spring and summer attacks in 1777 uh, across Western Virginia and what becomes Kentucky. As a matter of fact, they, they refer to this period as the year of the Bloody Sevens because it is a particularly bloody year. Cornstalk's assassination certainly provides motivation for the Ohio Indians to sort of ratchet up their attacks on white Western settlements. The murder of Cornstalk diplomatically was, um, was catastrophic. Patrick Henry is governor, Thomas Jefferson is governor. They knew, they realized that diplomacy and military alliances were the way to go with Native Americans and things that undermine, undercut those, undermine those, um, uh, certainly were, uh, were, were problematic and unfortunate, um, although there was almost nothing they could do about it. Founding Father Patrick Henry condemned the men who had participated in Cornstalk's murder as vile assassins. He believed that the death of such a revered and respected leader would bring about more bloodshed. Over the next several decades, he was proven right, as the Shawnee, now led by more militant chiefs like Blackfish, regularly raided the American settlements across the Ohio Valley. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a like, share, and be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.